Hello, wrestling fans. This is Brickhouse Baker, 2008 New England Hall of Famer. I need you people to do me a favor. I need you to go to Chops Video and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Again, that's Chops Videos. Go check this out because this guy's got some really good stuff from back in the day. Peace out. I am the Underground King, SWB, New England Hall of Famer, Tesla Strength founder and head coach. Looking for classic wrestling videos featuring New England Hall of Famers and legends? Check out Chop's videos on YouTube. That's a great story, man. You don't see that stuff now. I'd love to see that on independent level. Like, just go to a local show and see somebody do something like that. You don't see yeah. that much stuff like that. Even somebody to think about something like that. Like, when I wouldn't help George, that's the kind of stuff I would throw out. Like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Like, wow, nobody thinks that stuff. I say it to George online, like, we'd be talking. That's why he was like, dude, come in and help me with ideas. I was like, who am I? He's like nobody tells me shit like this like come and help me i was like i'll just sit and watch a show and throw stuff at you he was like okay come and do that that's awesome george is such a good kid um like i said i remember meeting george i think it was north of reading massachusetts and he said we had met before that in salisbury and i really i'm really I, sorry i don't remember that but again you know it, it's not like i forget it's just it's concussions I know I've had a lot of concussions and I lose memory. Um, I've had two strokes, one in uh, 2013, one in 2019, and that affects my memory a lot. Um, but George, um, with um, PWF Northeast, um, uh, PWF New England, when uh, Matt and Kyle were working with Sheldon Goldberg, they, uh, Matt and Kyle did a program with uh, the Canadians. Canadian story is uh, David Cole and... Um, Jay Buster. You know those two guys? I know Jay Buster. All right. Dave, I don't know him uh, personally, but I know when he was working for Primal and he was working doing the loop around that time. Well, they were doing the uh, Canadian Superstars. That's what it was. Canadian Superstars, him and Dave Cole. And Dave Cole's such a good, they're both good workers and they knew how to get key. And um, they did a beatdown at Matt and Kyle. So when they did the beatdown, uh, Matt and Kyle, where they just beat the, you know, they beat them with the belts and everything. They um, wanted me to do a promo where Matt and Kyle would just get in their bags and leave in the building. And they wanted me to approach Matt and Kyle saying, dude, what's going on? Where are you going? Because I remember Matt and Kyle being the dogs of war, the ones that did the beating downs, the tough SOBs, the whole nine yards. And what is this? They're just walking out because these two punks beat the crap out of them and try to pump them up. And that was going to lead to me getting involved with them in matches with um, Dave uh, J. Buster and uh, their manager, Brian Cairo, who, um, if Jim Cornette- Cairo won't talk to me. He's driving me crazy. Uh, I always said if Bobby Heenan, um, oh God, Bobby Heenan, Jim Cornette, had a child with somebody this would be their child uh cairo so and i mean and i think pwf had a great roster of talent especially with the managers tj wild um brian cairo sean gorman and gorman's great too yeah oh god he's a natural that kid is a natural Cairo and, would be such a great interview, man. I, I messaged him once, he answered me, and then I asked yeah. him about an interview, and he's like, I'm busy, hit me up again. And every time I hit him up, he won't answer me. I'm like, dude, uh, Cairo would be such a great interview. I'm like, everybody wants to hear from Brian Cairo. <laughs> he, he he would be a good interview because he's just – it's like natural talent. Um, and I remember – We uh, want to know what's on the mind of Brian Cairo. That's what I keep saying to him. <laughs> Um, we did a, um, I remember TJ, uh, TJ wild. Um, uh, I don't, story, I don't remember him. Uh, he was the early days of, um, PWF. Uh, he was a manager. Uh, and, and, uh, he, he was the, 
he was a kid who just, I, I, if I was a fan, I just want to strangle him. Like he's had a big mouth. Um, I'd have to watch the tapes. I do have a bunch of tapes of that stuff, but I haven't watched them like since then. Yeah, he, his name is Matt. He's a, he's a good he's, he's a good kid. Um, as, as a manager, he's one of the. There's there's some managers like Sean Gorman. If I didn't know Sean, and I was in the audience, I would want to kill him. That cocky son of a bitch, arrogant mother. You know, he's so Sean, good. Sean's great. I don't know him personally, but I've seen what I've seen of him. You know, managing. He's a great manager. He's brilliant. He is brilliant. He's a smart kid too. He's very, very, very smart. Um, but uh, uh, TJ Wild um, had made up these T-shirts that said TJ TJ Wild sucks, and they would sell them at the merch table. So for those who didn't like TJ Wild, you would buy these T-shirts. But nobody knew that these brilliant. were the shirts that he was selling. So he he was. He sold a bunch of shirts, but he still had a lot of shirts that weren't sold yet. And I was like, you're going to sell out of shirts tonight. He goes, how? I was like, you go on that microphone and you tell them, if one more person buys a TJ Wild suck, sucks t-shirt, I'm going to come out and I'm going to personally beat your ass. Sold out. And that was, just, that was something I learned from watching an interview with Roddy Piper. Um, Ray, this is going back to Portland, Oregon. Don Owens. I really don't know about a lot about that promotion. I, I'm just learning from interviews and stuff like that with the guys. But Roddy Piper uh, was a babyface. And Raven uh, was working under the name. It might have been his. Scott his Anthony. Legit, was that his, his legit name? Scotty the Body Anthony. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So, um. His Raven being, you know, brilliant was um, had somebody take a picture of him in the locker room, like a private picture, and it's him in the locker room sitting in a chair, you know, picking his nose. So the picture is, is like a, a candid picture of him picking his nose, right? So they would sell those, and when Scotty would come out, people would hold the picture up, and he'd get all mad and everything. Again, not realizing these are his pitches, you know, that he's selling. So the sales of the pitches started going down. And Piper said, dude, get on the microphone and just say, the next person who buys one of these pitches, I'm going to come out there and kick your ass. Everybody got up, went to the merch booth and bought a picture. He sold a lot of pitches. That's so that, that should have ripped them I, out of their hands and ripped them and said, don't <laughs> show me that again. And they have to go buy another one to hold it up. And that's what I love about MJF. Like, you, you see his meeting greet pitches where he signs the picture for the person and he just throws it off the table. <laughs> he makes him pick it up. You know, it's, and it's, and the thing is people can watch that and saying, Oh, what a jackass or what a jerk. No, that's the fan wrestler experience. You're going to meet this a-hole that you hate, but you love to hate him. He's signing an autograph for you. And his heel is persona is pushing the picture off, making you pick it up. It's an interaction. And that's what some people don't get, you know. Like he, he's being an a-hole because that's his character. And which I'm glad that he changed his name from Feinstein to Friedman. That I think Tommy Dream has smartened up on him on that because um Brian Myers trained MJF and um as a rib, he told him to use the Feinstein name and Tommy Dream has smartened him up and Think I changed his name, but um, yeah, the, the the kid's gonna be. He's only been working for like seven years. I think he started training in 2015. Um, he, he's he's already main main inventing AEW. You know, he's got a good program with uh, Punk, and he had a good program with um, Jericho, which I thought was a great match when they did the um, the, was it the five labors or seven labors? Yeah, whatever had, it was, I think it was five. Uh, the Jericho thing was 50 50 on me. It did him good, but it did him some bad too. Yeah. Uh, but the match, the, ma the Jericho, match itself was good, but some of the stuff surrounding it was bad. I, I agree. I agree. The, the singing, dancing stuff, he could have done 
without although he he did the best he could with it, he did it well with what for what it was, but for what it was was bad, I thought. I, uh the word I used was hokey. Right. But hokey. then again, it probably showed Vince McMahon some good stuff because that's something Vince would probably like. Exactly. Um I I've never worked for the WWF, so I don't know. Uh, as we've talked before, um, I've met Vince, um, thanks to Ray Roy, but um, so I can't say like right now why the product isn't as entertaining. Cesaro, are you kidding me? You can't come up with a, an agreement with Cesaro? Uh, I don't know. Like I said, like I don't know how they think, how... Like, I don't even know who this Nick Khan is, um, The what he does. He, I, I know he's involved. You know in, what he's lacking? Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson. Um, Briscoe. Briscoe. Those guys were... Um, the uh, backbone the, of the company. They, they, were, they created... So, like The funny thing, I, I hear stories about Pat Patterson, is like Pat Patterson brought, brought up the idea of the Royal Rumble. He created the Royal Rumble. He was like, yeah, we, we put a guy every minute, and then the place go bananas. <laughs> and I, I banana. Speak, banana. They go banana. <laughs> um, and, and, and kind of going back a little bit, like I said, I'm going over the place. Um, December, I want to say it was December 28, 1996. It was the night of my, my girlfriend at the time. It was her birthday. And Ray invited me down to the Providence Civic Center. They were doing a, um, a TV, uh, not a TV tape, a house show. And um, Ray was, uh, he, Ray wasn't wrestling on the on the card, but he was doing like ring jackets and stuff like that. Just, you know, helping out and everything. He got his couple of comp tickets. So we were getting ready to leave and um, we go outside the parking lot. And I just want to thank Ray and everything. And he goes, oh, I'll come down to the bar tonight. You know, we're going to hang out for a bit. And uh, this was uh, Timmy White's bar, uh, Funny Tap in um, Cumberland. And um, so I said, okay, yeah, why not? So we go to Timmy White's bar and um, uh, me and my girlfriend had gotten there and there was nobody there yet. You know, Ray hadn't gotten there. And none of the rest work has gotten there yet. And uh, so we, we sat at a table and the first two people to walk in is Triple H. And at the time, um, Glenn Jacobs was doing the fake diesel gimmick. And... Um, they walk in, they get some, you know, some drinks. Uh, I really think it was bottled water and maybe a soda. I think Triple H had like bottled water and Glenn Jacobs had like soda or something like that. And they're walking around and Triple H just comes to our table and goes, hey guys, how are you? I'm like, oh, good. He goes, hey, go to the show tonight. I'm like, yeah, you had fun. Yeah, you know. And I knew how to properly introduce myself. And it was just, you know, shake hands and say, hey, you know, Dave Padula, worker, you know. Um, I was, I, I was speechless, you know, just couldn't talk. And he goes, do, do you mind if we join you? Like, yeah, sure. Sit down, you know, and Ray comes over and he's like, oh, why are you sitting at Triple H's table? I'm like, look at, you look at Ray and Triple, Triple H goes, no, we asked if it was okay to sit here. And I'm like, oh, he's like, oh. and Ray and Triple H actually went to school together. Um, Tri Triple H might've been like a year or two. Uh, at the Kowalski school. He might have been there about a year or two longer and then Ray came in. So they knew each other. So when everybody came in, uh, they had a private room in the back and um, they had like catering set up and everything for the boys. And the boys would go into the back room, get some food, get some drinks. And they would come out and they say hello to the, you know, the regulars of any fans that were there. And Ray's like, oh, Dave, come with me for a second. And he took me to the back and introduced me to Arnold Skolin uh, Pat Patterson and Shane McMahon. And he's like, hey, this is Dave Padula. He's a worker, but good bumper. He's put me over to these guys. And uh, Arnold Scullin and Pat Patterson just, you know, they're sitting there, you know, just talking to me and stuff. He's like, uh, yeah, bring him down Monday night. And he's like, all right, cool, cool. And they walk away. I'm like, what's Monday night? He goes, Monday Night Raw. I was like, oh, okay. He goes, they, they're not promising you anything, but they, they're inviting you to come down. So um, you know, I'll be down there. So ride with me. I'll, you know, we'll go down. I was like, all right, cool. And this was um, Albany, New York. 
it was called the Knickerbocker Arena at the time. So um, on the way up there, Ray said, oh, just a couple of things I got to tell you. I was like, sure. He goes, when you go there, make sure you shake hands with everybody. Make sure you give them the proper handshake, you know, the kayfabe handshake. Um, stay away from Bret Hart. You know, don't talk to Bret. He's miserable. I was like, okay, no problem. So we get to Nickelback Arena. We check in. And the first locker room we go to is going to be our locker room. And um, I walk in and pretty much from left to right is the Headbangers, um, Aldo Matoya, uh, which is uh, the Just Incredible. Um, the Headbangers, Just Incredible, Crush, uh, Rocky Mayavia, The Rock. I mean, this is where he first started. And then Tiny the Terrible, Half Nelson, uh, Psycho Sid. And there's a couple other guys, I think that might have been locals. So I'll go around, and I'm shaking hands with everybody and uh, get the crush, get to the rock. It's super, super nice guys. And I get to Tiny the Terrible and we're talking, you know, you know Tiny the Terrible, of course, right? Oh yeah, I'll tell you about uh, my phone call with him sometime. Oh dear Lord, <laughs> he's a character. So yeah, asking him to do this, he's like, you are asking me to pay me, you better have some money. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's time. Th then he was wicked cool after he found out who I was and he, he actually called me and was like, Oh, I didn't know who you were, no problem, I'll do whatever you need, and all this stuff. Um, yeah, that's 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 tiny. Um, so he's sitting right next to Psycho Sid. So me and Tiny are talking and everything, and um Sid is sitting on the bench you know, on the bench in the in the locker room, and he's got his baseball hat turned backwards, and he's like cleaning up the belt and everything. And I said, oh, excuse me, Sid, my name is Dave uh, Padula, from, I work here from Rhode Island. And I shake his hand, and he's got a regular handshake, and I'm giving him the, the you know, the two-finger light handshake. And he goes, well, nice to meet you too, Dave, but don't give me that kayfabe handshake shit. Shake my hand like a man. And he puts his hand back out, and I walk away from him. Because <laughs> I am I just, I was nervous. You know, he's got mad at me for giving him a kayfabe handshake. And puts his hand back out to shake my hand, and I walk away from him. And he's sitting there with his hand out, looking at me as I'm saying hello to the other guys. And I walk out the door, and I hear him saying, "Like fat, bullheaded motherfucker, who the hell do you think he is?" And then I hear Dougie say, "I don't know who he is. I don't know." <laughs> uh, Dougie being tired and terrible, and um, I, I, I did not want to go back in that room, but I left my bags, bags in there and stuff. So uh, we go to catering. And it was me, Ray, uh, Tiny Terrible, Half Nelson, Al Snow, Ahmed Johnson, uh, Shane, and Vince McMahon comes over, says hello quickly, and gets his food. And Vince comes back and says, oh, do you mind if I join you, gentlemen? And nobody's saying anything. You know, they're just eating. And I'm like, sure, you know, have a seat. You know, who am I? To <laughs> so Vince sits down, he's eating, and he's, and he goes, and, and you are? I said, oh, Dave Padula, I'm working from Rhode Island. He goes, oh, he goes, who'd you train with? And I'm going through the story about how I started and uh, trained with Savannah Souza. And that kind of caught Vince's attention for a second. And he goes, oh, Savannah Souza, yes. I said, well, I remember Savannah Souza when I was a kid. My dad used to take me to Jack Witchie's on Friday nights. And that, you know, Vince is like, he almost like stopped eating and you know, conversated with me. And... Um, He's like, oh, are you working tonight? I was like, no, I said, I was actually asked to come down by uh, our school and Pat. Um, no, nothing's promised, but, you know, hey, you never know. He goes, oh, he goes, well, you know, hope to see you out there. You know, he's like, you know, just, it was chit-chat, you know, fr friendly banter. Um, so Ray takes me to the next locker room to say hello. And this is, I, I figure Sid would be in the style locker room, but he's in this locker room with the mid-carters. Um, and this locker room now, you know, Ray opens the door and he steps to a side and there's somebody doing stretching. So I'm trying to avoid pushing the door into this person. And as I do that, I trip over his leg and it happened to be Owen Hart. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He was like, well, that's okay. And I introduced myself to Owen Hart. Davey Boy was there. So I'm going around the, the locker room, uh, the fake diesel, the Razor Ramon, um, so Glenn Jacobs was the fake Diesel. The guy that was the fake Razor, I think his name was Ricky or Rick. Is that correct? 
Yeah, Rick. Uh, I can't remember his last name, though. It was Rick something. And uh, next to him was two guys who I've seen in ECW so many times. Uh, it was Doug Furness and Phil LaFon. A tremendous tag team. I've seen them work with the Eliminators. Had great matches. Yeah, and they then, were awesome in all Japan. If you ever seen them in all Japan, and they were really good over there. Even better than they were in ECW. Yes. Like, that's where I, I hated being a big guy, doing big guy moves. I would watch Demolenko. I would watch uh, the Eliminators. Uh, a lot of the mat wrestling stuff, reversals, chain wrestling. And uh, watching Phil Fon and Doug Furness, I, I mean, I wasn't fast and capable of doing a lot of that type of stuff. But I try to steal a little bit here and there. So as I'm leaving the Phil Fon, Doug Furness group, there's a couple more guys. Um, I, I, I don't know who it was. And then The Undertaker. And The Undertaker was talking to somebody. So I'm like, okay, you know, do I interrupt them? That's always been a big question. Like a lot of people ask, like, if, if somebody's talking to somebody, do you interrupt them? And I was always told, well, if it's, you know, like Vince McMahon talking to somebody in a corner, no, that might be a good time. But if they're just chit-chatting, friendly you know, banter, you know, maybe you can say hello, say, sorry to interrupt you. So I get to The Undertaker and I said, uh, Hi, I'm Dave Padula from Rhode Island. He stands right up. He goes, hi, I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Welcome to our locker room. And I thought that was the coolest thing. And not in a mockish way, but in a respectful way that this guy has no idea who I am. And he was, introduced me as his, his name. Everybody's using their, their gimmicks. Like Chris Candido, uh, before this, uh, I had met Chris Candido at a, a, a show in New, um, New York, Newburgh, New York. And I'm in the locker room and he, he's going around saying hello to everybody. And I, I said, oh, hi, I'm Dave Padula. He goes, hi, I'm Skip. And I'm like, dude, really? <laughs> uh, but that was okay, you know. But, um, but the, the Undertaker thing I thought was really cool because uh, when he stood up, introduced himself by his name, welcome to our locker room, you know, it, it, I thought it was a really cool thing, you know. So I try to take that and whenever – you know, I, if I go to a show, if I'm at a show, I try to do the same thing, you know, just to stand up. It takes two seconds to stand up, shake somebody's hand, you know. Um, I thought that was really cool. So now we got to go back to the locker room where my, my ba bags are. So I go in and me and Sid, Sid doesn't even look at me, doesn't acknowledge me, no nothing. So I, I go to this corner. And where the rock, uh, Rocky Maivia at the time, and Crush was sitting. I said, "Excuse me, guys. I says, do you mind if I, you know, sit over here? My bags? Like, sure. You know, because I didn't know where to sit. So I'm sitting there, and out of nowhere, Crush is talking about Eric Kulash, the mass transit incident with ECW. Because at this point, this was uh, December '96. This was one month after Rocky's debut at Survivor Series." And about a month after the uh, mass transit thing. So the story of the ECW mass transit thing is just get, you know, going around. So Rock's like, no, what happened? And Crush is telling his story and he kind of had it right. <laughs> and Rock's like, what? He goes, yeah, he took a blade. He sliced a kid from, you know, ear to ear. And, and, and Rock's like, you know, like, what? what? That's... So I was like, actually, yeah, he was, Eric was a friend of mine. Uh, he trained with a, a, a company and he was a young kid in the ring with the certain people that he would train with. He was good. He was okay because we knew his limitations. He was a big, clumsy kid. He was tripping over his feet. He had high blood pressure. He was six foot six, you know, like 500 pounds. You know, it was never suggested that he should go out and work for another company. Uh, he just wasn't ready professionally. He wasn't physically ready. Um, so, you know, that, we, that conversation came up. So, Tony Gurria comes in and um, Tony Gurria says, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, what's your name? And I says, Dave Padula. And he's got a clipboard. He goes, um, who booked you tonight? And I was like, actually, I was invited to come down by Pat Pass and I was going. I came down with, you know, uh, Ray Roy. Um, they, they said they weren't promised me anything, but if there's anything that comes up, he goes, well, Dave, um, and Tony Gurria was so nice and professional. He's like, unfortunately, um, 
I don't have you on the list and we really don't have anything extra opening. So um, I just need you to, um, you, you're free to go wherever you want. He says, I just need you to clear out the room because we need to clear out the room because some of the guys in here um, aren't working tonight. So we just need to get everybody, you know, that's not working tonight out of the room. I'm like, yes, sir. Um, and I asked, I says, Mr. Guerrero, I says, is there a place where I can keep my bag? He goes, well, I'll keep everything right here. You're good, you know. <clears throat> in hindsight, I kind of thought about this years later, like, should I really have left my bag there? <laughs> you know, thinking Sid's there, you know, uh, what, what, you know, what could I have done with my bag? But um, Good thing it wasn't X-Pac or Owen or somebody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I was always thinking about, you know, you hear the stories and stuff. I mean, being locked to something, yeah, I can see if I'm putting stuff in there. I don't know. But um, so, yeah, I left the room and um, just started walking around and just watching um, the um, seamstress. Uh, Sean Michaels was there. I'm sorry. Um, Sean needed something different for his outfit and the girl's got a pad and she's like drawing stuff and Sean's like um you know he's telling her like something like this something like that and she's drawing it and he goes yeah that's it and she takes the fabric and she's putting it through the machines passes it to the next person passes it to the next person and in five minutes he's got a whole new outfit and I thought it was absolutely amazing how they do that you know it's just it's so organized backstage so I totally avoided Sid that night like try to stay away from him uh, March 1997, the first night that WWE used the Titantron. Before this, they would use the RAW, um, the raw letters as their entrance. Just yeah, a basic yeah, the big, the like cavo of the letters. So this is about yeah. three months later. Yes, this was. Um, so the first time, my first TV was uh, experience was um, December, uh, the last Monday of December. This is a couple months, three months later in March. It yeah, was December of 96 and like March of 97. Okay, I'm just trying to keep get it in my head. Yeah. Um, so this was the, um, the first time um, uh, WWE used this, the, the ramp with the big stage. And this is a big production. We got there about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They were starting to build the stage. And this is the first time they built it. And they were like trying to figure out how to where work goes where. And they were there since six o'clock. And me and Jose was me, Jose, and Ray. Me and Jose just sat there on the side, just watching them put everything together, the pyro and everything. So me and Jose are like glued to watching this. Well, next thing we know, uh, this is during the uh, ECW uh, invasion. Uh, Paul, Paulie, Tommy Dreama, Taz, uh, Dudley's, a uh, whole bunch of ECW guys. They're off to the side of the stands, not, not too far from where we were, and they're holding um, a meeting. What, what they're going to do you know, for the night and everything. And one of the guys with the group comes over to us, me and Jose. And I'm thinking, all right, this guy's going to like be like, who the hell are you guys? Why are you here? You know, Because it's not like you have any identification or a, pa a backstage pass or anything. So the guy comes over to us and he starts smiling and he goes, Hey, you're Damien King. And I'm like, hi. And I shake his hand and he goes to Jose. And he's like, and you are, I can't remember that. Cause when Jose did uh, El Diablo, he wore a uh, hood, but then he, Jose did like Jose Perez. He did a Charlie Bruin gimmick, which is like a Charlie Brown type of gimmick. And this guy recognizes uh, Jim William yeah. Payne. What's that? Sergeant William Payne. Yes. And <laughs> so like my head went like this. You know, here's this guy from ECW coming over to us, acknowledging who we were. And I had no idea who the guy was. I had no idea of anything about him. As he's talking to us, he's explaining he's the ring announcer for the ECW, for this, for the East Coast area. And I'm like, oh, cool, great. And I'm, I'm, now I'm, in my mind, I'm asking, how does he know us? So Jose, in the conversation with him says, oh, I live in Fall River or New Bedford at the time he was, and I see you guys on cable access. And, and he was the nicest, nicest person we ever met. Like, he was just such a great guy. And that was Rich Palladino. I was just going to say, who was it, Richie? <laughs> Rich Palladino, 
Um, to this day, I, uh, one of the kindest, nicest people. He's one of the guys, um, when you go to a wrestling show, whether it was ECW, we would go to ECW shows and see him, um, or uh, uh, some of the local shows, Chaotic. Whenever you see Rich, you smile. He's just got that energy. He's just such a night, nice, great person. And um, and Rich was actually there the night I got my tooth knocked out. Um, oh, so uh, we got that a second. So um, the, the what's the centrum uh, for Monday Night Raw? You know, we're talking to Rich, and then you know we go to catering, and Ray Roy wrestled Ahmed Johnson that night. You know, we're just sitting there watching everything, and. When we're all at catering, uh, our table was me, Ray Roy, Jose, Brian Pillman, um, a couple other guys. The next table over was like Road Warriors, Sabu, and then Steve Austin comes in. And Steve Austin comes in, gives Brian Pillman a big hug. And it was kind of a weird thing to see because they're such good workers. Uh, and they were at a big feud at that time. They were a very... You know, they, they had that that feud. It was just, it was good to see them together. You know, when they were in WCW, I thought they were one of the greatest tag teams. Um, and Sid comes in. So when Sid comes in to the catering, he's going up to all the tables. And he said, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And he comes to our table and he's shaking hands with everybody. I just stop piling food in my mouth. <laughs> I just totally ignore him. <laughs> and um, so he goes around and skips me. Um, a couple of months later, Ray took me to the uh, King of the Ring in Providence. Uh, it was the one that um, Hunter went over. And um, 90, so this is King of the Ring 97. And um, so we're, we're just, we're, we're sitting on the side, you know, stage, King of the Ring, watching everything. And um, Howard Frankel, um, before, as me and Ray are leaving, we're going through the back. And Howard Frankel says, uh, so Ray, we're going to see you tomorrow. And uh, yeah, Howard, I, it was Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, I'll be there. And Howard Finkel, who I met maybe for about a second at the uh, Knickerbocker Rinka sh show, says, and David, well, I see you at uh, Hartford. And it's just people do his impression. You know how they do the Howard, uh, Howard uh, Finkel impression? Like, you know, like, the Madison Square got it. There will be, you know, how, they, how, how it talks. Joe and Bruin I, does it awesomely. Who's that? Joe Bruin does it awesome. Really? I never heard him. I've heard uh, on Gallo. the interview I do with him, he does it, and he does it perfect. Oh damn! But so he he asked Ray, he goes, Ray, will I see you tomorrow night at Howard Civic Center? And he goes, Yeah, Howard, I'll be there. And David, will I see you at the Howard? Civic Center? <laughs> I was like, Yes, Howard, I'll be there tomorrow night. And I'm laughing. I'm, I said, to, I get Ray's card and like, Ray, because he talks just like he talks when he does his promos. <laughs> and then I hear Luke Gallows uh, do his impersonation of him. And I'm like, that is so scary. It's like spot on. And that's exactly how he talks. But um, I was yeah, just. I'll I have was, to tag you in a couple things. I'll have to tag you in that and the Anthony thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, but just, just the point that Howard. Arnold, Arnold Skolin, How, um, Howard Finkel, Arnold Skolin, Georgie Emil Steele. Every time I went to a TV tape and all those guys remembered my name. It wasn't like they came up to me like, hey, how you doing? It was like, David, how are you? They always remember my name. I thought it was really cool. Uh, back in the, the December 96, when we we're at the Timmy's Bar, we we're in the back room. And as um, I was, uh, Shane McMahon, I'm sorry, was the third person. So it was uh, Pat Pass and Alan Skolin, and then once they walked away, Shane McMahon came over and said hello to Ray. Ray introduced me to Shane McMahon. Super, super nice kid. And I saw the uh, George Amos Steele sitting in the corner, kind of like just looking at me, just staring. And I, you, could, you could tell he's looking right at me. And um, so I'm sitting there, you know, talking to Shane, and then Shane walks away. And George Steele kind of like sits up, and he looks at me, waves me over. And I walk up to him. I was like, how you doing, sir? Dave Padula. And he goes, what do you use to shave your head? I was like, uh, Gillette Twin Blade. He goes, yeah, me too. You use shaving cream or, he goes, you use shaving cream or gel? I said, like, I actually use conditioner. Conditioner, why? 
I said, because it softens the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the skin better, you know, the hairs and stuff like that. Next thing I know, I'm sitting there for 20 minutes, 25 minutes talking to George and we'll about shaving our heads. It was such a nice guy, you know, and he always remembered me every time we saw her. Um, Percy Pringle, um, Paul Barra. Um, when I met him, again, Ray introduced me to him and I'm sitting there, the, the flashbacks of world class, you know, and I'm sitting with, you know, just listening to him and Every time I saw uh, Paul Bearer, it was like, uh, he's got that Southern high voice. Like, he's still got the Paul Bearer voice, but not that as high, but it's very Southern. And um, he's such a really nice guy. Just it, 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 Really, every guy there was was nice. And then you had Sid. He, he had a great mind for the business, I think. I would have loved to have seen him spend more time with Rick Rude. Him and Rude in the early world class, I would have loved to have seen more of them two together. Yes, absolutely. Um, the I'm trying to think where I left off with the Worcester Centrum. So the the Sid comes around, goes around the table, and you left uh, off with Vince McMahon sitting with you, and uh, you were talking to Vince about. Uh, well, that the, was that was the Knickerbocker Arena show. That was the um, the one in December. Then Sid and he, came around and uh, he you started eating, so he walked yes, away. That's uh, Worcester. Uh, so it's me, Jose, Ray, and Sid comes over the, the table. ECW guys come up to you and yes, uh, Rich Palladino. You told us that. Yep. So when, when Jose kept busting around with me, like during the whole night, you know, um, uh, Jose is like, oh, here comes Sid, here comes Sid. But Sid wasn't coming down anywhere. He's so, um, oh, King of the Ring was, uh, was in Providence. And Howard Finkel is like, oh, David, will we see you in Harvard Connecticut Civic Center tomorrow night in Harvard, Connecticut? I think, like, yes, sir, I'll be there. And um, the next night, uh, we got there really early. And um, I was sitting off to the uh, side of the stage. And they were going over some of the things for the night. And um, they were filming the, um, this is when the, um, the nation turned on Farouk. They had to do a couple of tapings for that. And I'm walking in the back. And that's when the Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels thing happened. The, the, supposedly they had the big fight in the, in the locker room fight, the whole night of the brawl. Um, I wasn't, maybe, I was maybe 50 feet from this and all I saw was two people kind of like grabbing each other pushing uh, almost like two kids like just messing around there was no punches being thrown there was no fighting like there was nothing but Vince did scream at him and, 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 and told him to leave they were, out of, they were off for the night and the Undertaker was right there and Vince is staring at both of them with like this angry look and I'm standing against the wall trying to like I don't want to be seen, you know, just try to, you know, mind my own business. And the Undertaker standing right next to Vince McMahon and Undertaker just goes, so does this mean I can use Michael's pyro tonight? And you could tell Vince just wanted to bust out laughing. And Vince just looked at Taker and went, Mark, not tonight. Don't stop with me tonight. But he was, he was saying it jokingly. But um, the... The match was um, Rob Van Dam against two Colt Scorpio. And at this time, he was known as Flash Funk. So I was standing um, in one of the uh, tunnel ways of the, uh, the uh, Hartford Civic Center. And somebody comes up behind me and um, puts their hand on my shoulder. He goes, hey, what match are we in? And I go to say, oh, uh, Rob Van Dam and Flash Funk. And as I go to turn to see who it is, it's Sid. And he, I look at him. I'm like, oh, it's Rob Van Dan and Flash Funk. And I see it's Sid. And he goes, do I make you nervous? <laughs> and I was like, yes, very nervous. And he goes, why? And I said, Sid, I says, my first TV taping of being invited down and I screwed up. I said, I didn't know what to do. He goes, well, shake my hand. And I shook his hand. He goes, much better. <laughs> And, and I tell everybody that story, and I know like people tell you know people exaggerate stories, something like that. And I know Matt Storm, 
he went to a show that uh, Sid was on. Um, I don't know who, what promotion it was, but I know he worked on a show with Sid. And this is a couple of years later after that whole thing. He asked Sid about it. And Sid goes, yeah, I remember him. <laughs> he, goes, he was like, fat motherfucker, gave me a kayfabe handshake. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, I, 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 and, and the thing I tell everybody is like, I always, I always enjoy talking about wrestling, about um, little bits and pieces of things I've done and, and experiences I have I had, and I never went, you know, I never wrestled, wrestled Madison Square Garden, I never wrestled, you know, any big matches, you know, um, but just being able to have be as a kid say I want to be a wrestler, and doing it, and especially with somebody that I grew up at, you know, I was very close with, uh, Slay Steve Stallion we did it, you know, we, we didn't, I didn't make it big, but we fulfilled the dream that we said we wanted to do. And when I was in seventh grade, Huey Bain junior high school, um, I wanted to be on the wrestling team. And um, John Bonaventure was the math teacher and he was the uh, wrestling coach. And when I went to tryouts, he said, why do you want to be a wrestler? I was like, because I want to be a professional wrestler. He goes, wait, wait, wait. You want to be an amateur wrestler so you can go off and do that fake shit? And I went, no, it's not fake. And he goes, you don't think professional wrestling's fake? I was like, no. He goes, get out of my, get out of my, 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 my gym. So I, I never made the wrestling team. And I was pissed. But by get into the wrestling business and doing wrestling, I felt like that was my big F you to him. You know, like, don't tell me I can't do something, you know? So, and there's a lot, I think there's a lot of reasons why people get into wrestling. And, and this is why I think there's a difference between Steve Stallion and Donnie DeLuca, because Donnie DeLuca is a very humble, quiet person who's very shy. Steve Stallion allows him to be somebody that he's not, you know, it allows him to get that attention where, you know, he, he got all big built up and we go to South Bay beach and the girls would be gawking at him. He, he, he liked that, you know, he liked that attention, but Don DeLuca is, wasn't that type of person, but being Steve Stallion, he, he was able to get that attention and he liked that. And that's why I think he took it sometimes not too far, but he would always carry that out to the public. And, but, you know, and, and it's like magic, you know, um, what I learned is um, David Copperfield never, ever, ever has David Copperfield ever cut a woman in half. David Copperfield has never made the Statue of Liberty disappear. I love magic. I perform like card tricks. I do small magic tricks. I know he's not going to make the, the statue disappear. He's not cutting somebody in half. He's not disappearing in one place and Trump in another place. But I will pay $100, $200 to go see David Copperfield live. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know what he's doing isn't happening. But the way he presents it, you know, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief. And the same thing with wrestling. If you can perform and work and make people uh, suspend the disbelief. You know, people have known wrestling has been a, you know, whatever you want to call it, a work or a show. They've known that since the 1930s. There are movies that were made, in black and white films, that expose wrestling, you know, uh, being a show. Um, but as far as it being fake, it's not fake. You know, uh, I, don't, I mean, I don't have to tell anybody that. It's just the, the, the bumps are real. When you hit that mat, it's not a trampoline. It's not a bed. It's not a mattress. Um, you get injuries. I've lost, I think, six teeth altogether. And um, the, the front tooth that I lost um, was for my tryout with Chaotic. And this is when Anthony, Gino, Matt, and Kyle were uh, with uh, – this is just before they got into the hardcore the uh, match type stuff. And um, I went down – to the gym to do this tryout match and I was set up with the uh, cue ball. You remember cue ball, Primo? Oh yeah. And uh, he, he's 
good guy, easy to work with. I never worked with him, but you know, seeing him working. Where was other, this match that you lost your tooth? Where did it take place? Um, it was at the Barton Street Community Center, and I believe it was Central Falls, Rhode Island. It's either Central Falls or Pawtucket, but it was, the, it was called the Barton Street Community Center. This was uh, the either the last Saturday of March 2001 or the first Saturday of April 2001. That's and not New Bedford? No. No, this was in um, Rhode Island. Oh, there's, uh, there's different Barton Street Community Centers? Oh, this yeah, this one is in Rhode Island. And um, we... Um, uh, they 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 um, gave us um, we had three matches to do, me and uh, Q Ball, and the first match they want to see certain moves, the second match another certain was would be like more different type of moves, and the third match so this match they wanted to see um, a splash, uh, something you know whatever, um, and I remember when I got there, everyone's joking with me, Dave. This is a family, friend, family friendly type of promotion. We don't do hardcore here. There's no bleeding. Please do not do hardcore tonight. Joking with me. Just joking. I said, yeah, no problem. So um, when it's time for me and the cue ball to go out and do our match, it was, um, I had never met Jamie, the owner, you know, the owner for Chaotic. Never met him. Uh, Rich was there. And what, what we did was, before you got in the ring, Rich would do a promo with you, like a 30 second promo, whatever, 30 second promo. And I am definitely afraid of promos. Um, I, I just feel like my voice is just, I didn't have confidence in myself. So Rich is like, oh, I just need a 30 second promo. And I'm like, uh, and Rich is like, Dave, I know you, you know, you don't like doing promos, but just, just give me something, you know? All right. So I gave him something and I thought it was actually pretty decent and um jamie comes over to me and he goes hey you know yeah it's nice to meet you he goes i heard a lot about you i know the, i know you do the hardcore stuff but just we don't do hardcore here and he's like you know just no blood no no none of that stuff tonight i was like oh yeah 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 i, I got you and me and you know cue ball go in there we do our match everything and there was a point in the match where i threw him in the corner I come charging and he comes up with the elbow. And when he came up with the elbow, instead of me taking it properly, you know, turning my head, protecting myself, I went in the elbow face first and caught me right in the mouth. My top teeth go through my, uh, my lip and I hear, just hear everybody go, oh, and I, I, I'm bleeding. Like, I hear crunch. I, I can't feel my teeth, no nothing. And cue balls like, I, I'm I'm still going, setting myself up for them. So we're gonna do the the uh, the elbow, and then I go out, I turn around, and he goes to sit on the top rope, catch me for the uh, the tornado DDT, for the finish. So luckily that was the finish, and got me in the DDT. He kept asking me, you "Okay, okay." I'm like, "Yeah, fine, fine." Take the DDT, boom, 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 and I go to roll out of the ring, and everybody's checking on me, like frantically. Uh, Rich and Biggs and 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 Cuba are like, oh my god, you know, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, I get into the, the dressing room and I go to look in the mirror. Blood, I, my teeth are through my lip, blood just like gushing out, and I almost fainted. So we had two more matches to go, and I kept passing out. So they're like, nah, we, we you can't. And I was like, Ugh. and I and and I kept telling uh, Cuba. Like, Sat with me, make sure I was okay. He kept apologizing. I said, dude, this is, I didn't turn my head. I said, this has nothing to do with you. And um, so I told him, I said, dude, dude, go in there, go in the ring with somebody else. You, you'll, you, you'll do fine. And um, I remember I went to the hospital and I went to the emergency room and they went to, they got some kind of cleaning solution and they went to pour it because they couldn't see nothing. It was just blood. And they went to pour it over my lip and I had to, shoot, because my teeth went to my lip, I had a hole. It was just going down my throat. So they stitched up my lip and I asked the doctor, I says, am I going to lose my teeth? And he goes, well, you got to let it heal up. They might go back in place, whatever. So I said, all right. So four weeks later, I go to my, my dentist and 
he tells me, he goes, well, you, you got the, the three teeth in the front and the top. Two of them went back up, went back into place. The middle one is totally, it's gone. You got to get, you got to have it taken out. So I freaked out. I cried. I was like, no, I can't lose my tooth, right? And so I make an appointment, takes the tooth out and put the gauze in there. And like, I, I'm like all day long I'm looking at it in the mirror. I'm like, oh my God, this looks ridiculous. I need to get this. I, I, I got to get my tooth filled in. This was 2001, 21 years ago. I still got it, you know? <laughs> so then after that, I, I oh my god, two thousand one was twenty one years ago. Yeah, that's that's scary to think about. But that's why yeah. that's where all the footage I have is from. That's why I'm like, I got to put this up online. This is all from like twenty years ago and stuff. You know what I mean? That's why I got to put it yeah. up there. But the um, I, I I I know we have tons to talk about. Like it's just it's it's not just about me too that I could talk about. I like talking about other people, like uh, Jose. Um, if Jose, oh, yeah, I'm no. looking to get the story out there, all of it. That's why I'm saying there's no way we can sit and do it. We've already skipped over all kinds of stuff, I feel like, but we've also said so much, you know what I mean? Really, and uh, the Jose in 1995 96, when I brought up the idea about the hardcore match, you know, the, the barbed wire, if he said no, I probably would have never went and did anything else, I, I probably would just stopped. Um, but he he was just, yeah, sure, let's do it. And that kind of kicked me in the butt because um, there was a 20, before 20 Rumble passed, uh, there was a show he did in Boston at Club Good Times. Oh, and I, think I did it, a Tony Rumble tribute too, by the way. I did a video and then I did a five and a half hour tribute video oh, wow. uh, of matches and stuff he did. When that night in Boston, we had spoken to a lot. He was trying to set me up with Abdullah. He, I remember the first time I met Tony. And somebody told him that what I do, and he's like, oh, I, I got to put this guy with, with Abdullah the Butcher. And Tony sat with me in the back one night. He says, I got this vision. Your last name is Padula. I was like, yeah. He goes, Abdullah the Butcher and Padula the Butcher. Tag team. And I'm like, well, can I we at least wrestle the guy first? <laughs> But um, we, we never got a chance to uh, work it. And Tony Rumble had passed. Um, 98 maybe it was. I think it was. I think it was 98 he had passed. And um, I never I, I never got to work with uh, Abdullah the Butcher. But at one of the Rumble shows, um, I remember Bob Evans was, was there. And I've always looked up and uh, respected Bob Evans because... When I first started getting into wrestling, I would go to some of the local shows, and Bob Evans, Steve Bradley. It was ninety nine uh, that Tony Rumble passed, uh, November thirteenth, ninety nine. Yeah. Okay. So it was just before that. It was Club Good Times, and um, at that show, Bob Evans came up to me, and he says, uh, "Hey, you know, I, I would love to use you sometime, but I just don't do that. I, I don't because he was, you know, booking shows and stuff." He goes, I just don't do the hardcore match. And I noticed that I was digging myself in a hole because I was just doing the hardcore stuff. So everybody associated with me, oh, that's that hardcore guy. Um, uh, El Mascarado, Bert Santino. He, um, he used to call me Blida. And um, he, would, he would book me for his shows. And he was like, hey, Blida, I, wanna, I, for the, I need you for this date. You know, I need you for this date. And it was always hardcore matches. And I was like, oh, and I started realizing like, oh, he's just going to be doing hardcore matches, I guess, you know, which I kind of got depressed about in a way. And then um, March of 2022, I'm sorry, March of 2002, um, I went to a show in Bristol, Rhode Island, and um, it's for XWA Rhode Island, Mike Antonucci's company. And I went up with uh, Matt, Matt Storm and a couple of guys. And during just hanging out before the show, Matt comes up to me and says, hey, uh, you wouldn't want to work short Steve Sampson, would you? And I was like, hell yeah. I, 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 Tiny the Terrible and Half Nelson. 
I wrestled them a million times. So much you can do with those type of guys. It, we had, always had a lot of fun. And um, one of the, the the midget wrestlers didn't show up. They didn't have anybody for uh, half, uh, for um, uh, short sleeve um, Samson. And I seen him work for the WWE when he would team up with Scotty Too Hardy and them, and they do the worm together and stuff. And um, when I met short sleeve, um, all, I, all I said to him, I says, brother, I don't care what we do tonight, as long as you do the worm on me. And he was like, yeah, sure, you know. And um, th that match is on YouTube. And that probably had to be one of the most fun matches because when I went out there, I was just, I went out there, um, mouthing off some of the kids. I got in the ring. And it was basically, the story was, I was told to come up here. I was booked on the show. Now I'm t being told that I got no match. There's nobody for me to wrestle. I says, well, if they got nobody for, to, for me to wrestle, then I'll have to wrestle somebody out of here. And I'm pointing to different kids and, you know, people in the, out in the audience and stuff. And, of course, short stage music come out. He comes out running until the, we stop the match, you know. And um, I, I, I always call, what I do is, at some point in the match, I do this. And I still know, to this day, I don't know what this means. Like, if I was able to go to the top rope and do something, I wouldn't know. So basically, it's supposed to be like, you know, go to, I'm going to the top rope and, and do something, a flip or something. But I never you got to do a, a moonsaw or something. It's supposed to be yeah, moonsaw. Well, you know, it's just a single. I'm, I'm, a you know, 450. You're going to do a 450? What's that? 450. You're going to do a 450? Oh, I can't even walk right. I can't go tripping. Um, so it's supposed to signal that I'm supposed to be doing a 450, uh, moon salt, something. So I'm working on Sorshi Samson and, um, he cuts me off and then, you know, boom, I hit him. I go like this. So I told him Ric Flair and in the back, I said, you know, listen, he says, uh, when I cut you, when, when I, when I cut you off, I'm going to, I do this and I go to the top rope, get up and catch me. Like they do a Ric and toss me. He's like, yeah. They go. And I said, I'll, I'll come around and I'll, I'll, I'll position myself for the for the bulldog. That, that's his finish. And then you do the worm to hold nine yards. So when I cut him off, I do this. I go to the top rope. <laughs> and not, not remembering, he's a midget. So I go to the top rope and I put my foot on the top rope. And he comes over, he catches me, but he can't reach me. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, if you watch the video, he's jumping up and down trying to grab me. So I, I go with it and do we do the we do the he does the toss. And um, as I get up, he comes with the bulldog. I position myself in the ring. He does the worm. And one, two, three. If you watch that match, just put that volume up. That that those kids. There might have been maybe a hundred, 150 people there. You would have thought it was a sold out state. It was just so loud. And that's that was one of the most fun matches that I had. And just not doing the hardcore match and just doing a nice, simple, entertaining match like that was awesome. And then um, I got to do um, a tag match with um, Matt and Kyle Storm. What was that for? XWA? Yeah, that was XWA Rhode Island, Mike Antonucci's company. And I've um, never been to it or seen it, but I've seen it on, you know, on uh, Facebook and stuff. Jose was working with them a lot, right? Yes, down in West Warwick. Uh, he had the school there. Um, they had a really nice setup there. Uh, they had the Thursday night throwdown. Um, after that match, um, I wrestled uh, another time with uh, Matt and Kyle Storm against the uh, Canadian Destroyers. Dave Cole, Jay Buster, and... Um, Are they really brothers? Who's that? Is that breaking kayfabe for me to ask? You don't have to if you don't want to. But Matt and Kyle, are they really brothers? You don't have to answer it. Never mind. Go on. Um, no, they're, they're not. They're, they're, they'll tell you. Um, okay, I can edit that off of here if you want. I've just always personally wondered for myself. I'll edit it off if you want me to. No, no, no. Uh, blood brothers? No. But close enough. Right, they, right. They're brothers. I just always wondered if they were, because I know it started out with Vert as a brother and all that. So I just, I just always wondered if them two really were, and then they just pretended Vert. Well, you know what I mean. I just, I didn't know. 
It don't really no, matter, but no, nah, it's um, it's funny because I thought for the longest time they were brothers, and it's because of them. Okay, so August, and I know they got in that big fight and wasn't talking for a couple of years, and then started talking. I didn't know if that was really family stuff. You know what I mean? No, that that heat was legit, but that was caused by there's a guy, um, the guy that was involved with the whole mayhem thing was his ring name was Black Wolf. And his real his real name is Randy Blake. That's gonna play a part in two seconds. Um, so I did the match with Matt Kyle uh, against the Canadian Destroyers with Brian Cairo, and um, that was a bunch of fun. So I was like, at that point, I'm like, that's it. I'm, I can't wrestle no more. My back is killing me. My knee is killing me. So one night, I think it was like 2005. Again, Mike Antonucci from XWA Rhode Island. He's, uh, I'm an AOL messenger and he sends me a message. He goes, Hey Dave, do you want to wrestle Ariel tonight? And do you remember Ariel? Local. Oh Ariel? yeah. The Portuguese princess. Uh... Yes, absolutely. Um, that night we were supposed to drive to, um, this is when she was dating, um, uh, this is 2005 now, so I think it's 2004, 2005. She was dating Kid Mikazi, who's now married to Sasha Banks, working with the WWE as they're uh, making their gear and stuff like that. And um, we were supposed to go up to Pennsylvania the next day. So I was going to drive her and Mikazi to the show. This is at the Rhode Island School for the Deaf in Providence, Rhode Island. I was supposed to drive them to the show. Then we were going to head over to Pennsylvania for the next night and uh, for the next the, the show the next day. At, it was like an all female uh, alpha um, XW X W X W alpha ran in Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, X W X W. Yep. Yeah. So he was running Samoa out, and all, alpha runs it. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, exactly. And um, he was running a female show the next night. So during the day, Mike hits me up on the internet and on the AOL and says, hey, Dave, do you want to wrestle Ariel tonight? I was like, why would I wrestle Ariel? And he says, well, Mercedes Martinez uh, hurt her neck, so she couldn't work that night. So I figured, you know, you like to do the comedy stuff now, you know, because it's easy, you know, it's easy on the body and everything. So I started thinking, Ariel will never go for this. She'll, she'll be like, wrestle a uh, Dave Padula guy. Why would I do that? You know? So I sent Mike a message. I was like, dude, I said, that would be funny, but I don't think Ariel would be up to it. She goes, dude, it's her idea. I was like, oh. I said, well, I'll do it on one condition. And he goes, what's that? I'm like, do you trust me? He goes, sure. I think, okay, don't worry about it. He goes, what's the condition? The condition is you trust me. So I pick up, I pick up Ariel and um, I told her, I said, listen, I said, I have this idea in my head. Your opponent, she's a champion, XWA women's champion. Um, your opponent, your, your challenger does not show up. You're not the type of champion to take a, 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 like, you know, just forego the match and, you know, be awarded the winner without fighting a match. You're a fighter. You're a, you're a proud woman's champion. So you're going to issue a challenge to anybody in the locker room for the XWA Women's Heavyweight Champion, for the XWA Women's Championship. She goes, okay. I said, but here's the, here's the story. You're going to wrestle me. She goes, yeah. But you're not going to wrestle me. She goes, what do you mean? Live wire Dave Padula is so crazy in the head and so desperate for a title that he'll do anything to get a match. And she says, okay. And I said, do you remember who Adrian Adonis is? And she didn't know who Adrian Adonis was. Do you remember who Adrian Street is? And she goes, no. And I said, all right. I said, I went to Savers, which is... Um, it's like a local thrift store here. So I went to a Savers and I bought this big, ugly floral mumu. 
a big ugly blonde wig. I bought a pink purse, a, a red cowgirl hat. Like it was a Adrian Adonis to a T. So she thought I said this. I'll, I'll be in. I'll be in character. I'll use a, a fake name. Uh, and then during the match, you'll expose me, you know, like, oh, I'm a really a guy, you know. And she's like, you know, it'll be funny. So I get dressed and I bought this makeup kit, right, that from a convenience store, like just some, you know, different kind of makeup, something like that. So I said, and I told Ariel, I said, listen, I said, do you want it? Do you mind doing my makeup? And she goes, yeah, how do you want it? I says, as trashy as, I said, really ugly, trashy, you know. So I went in my pocket, right? And I had a cell phone. This wasn't a smartphone. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have, this was, you know, 2005. So we basically, it was a candy bar, Nokia phone. So I'm going on the internet. I Google, um, oh my God. It was a Drew Carey show, Mimi. Yeah, Mimi show. with the big blue stuff all over her eyes and stuff. Yeah. So I bring up a I bring up a picture on my phone of Mimi. I said, I want to look like this. So she does my makeup and everything. I look at it in the mirror. And uh, Ariel always knew me as being funny, not being quiet. So as she's doing the makeup and everything, I'm super quiet. She goes, Are you okay? I'm like, yeah. She goes, You're really quiet. I'm like, no, I'm thinking about you know the match and stuff. So she does my makeup and I go to look at it in the mirror. I was like, oh my God, this is so perfect. If Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister and Mimi from Drew Carey had a kid, that I was it. It was perfect. So I, I we had these two balloons, right? I put them in, in, under the dress for boobs, right? And I said during the match, I said I, I put a a, a, a pin uh, on my shirt. I said during the match, you're gonna take, you're gonna rip this pin off my right, and you're gonna pop the balloons and I'm going to sell it like crazy. And then we do the spot where she goes to grab my hair and to flip me and I hold the ropes and she flips the wig off. And we did a, we did a uh, sunset flip spot where I go down and she sunset flips, flips me. And as I go down, you know, she's got the legs here and she looks down underneath the moo. She goes, Oh my God, it's a boy. <laughs> but you know, I had shorts and everything on underneath it. The crowd absolutely loved it. It was total comical. It was it was such a great match. Um, at the very end of the match, Rich Bass was our referee, and he's trying not to bust out laughing. And I'm, you know, I'm Ariel's selling. You know, I'm I'm trying not to be too rough with her, um, but with the moves and stuff like that. Like I'm just trying to you know just push her around and stuff. And Rich Bass calls, take it home. So I was like, all right, so. I'm working over uh, Ariel, and I said, oh, you take it home, take over, take over. And she goes, I can't, I can't. I'm like, no, you got to take over, you got to take it home. She goes, I can't stop laughing. <laughs> she was laughing so hard. <laughs> but, we, you know, we got the match over, and we got in the back, and um, it, it was such a crazy match. But the um, my, my, my entrance for that match was just supposed to be um, – some song, I can't remember the song I was supposed to use. And I had this fake female name that's supposed to be kind of like, you know, like Chris something. Like, one of the, is it a guy? Is it a girl? We don't know. Um, and next thing I know, my music is Dude Looks Like a Lady. And we came off the stage at the School for the Deaf. It was like, you know, like a, uh, a school theater stage. And it had the curtains. And before I went out, um, uh, Psycho Mike and Jose, they're like, dude, before you go out there, have your back turned to the crowd. And as the music plays, we'll shake the curtains and split the curtains. So you're there, you start dancing, and then you turn around and you walk to the ring. So I think, all right, cool, that'd be funny. So they're playing the music, they're shaking the, cl cl uh, the, the uh, curtains. I come... I turn around and I face the crowd and I go, hello, like Mrs. Doubtfire. I'm, I'm now, I'm trying, I'm trying not to laugh at myself. And they're like, and heading to the ring, 
from Blackstone, Massachusetts, Randy Blake, which was Black Wolf from the uh, Mayhem. And the joke behind that was the, there was a rumor that Randy Blake uh, was a cross dresser. He was into, um, so that's why they named him Randy Blake. But that was probably the most fun match that I had. And this is, like I said, it was about 2005. And I just kept saying, like, I'm never going to do hardcore again. Never going to do hardcore again. And uh, Danny Harvey uh, was running APW. And, um, you know, he asked me to, to work for the company. And um, he booked me in a four-way match. It was supposed to be myself, uh, Hothrob, Dana Kana, uh, Dana Kama, um, Tex McCoy, uh, Tex McCoy, Dana, and one other person. Let me and... say something about Ariel real quick before we move on. Uh, my first big hit on my website was a match with her against the crazy Mexican, who is Steve Ricard under a mask. Yes. Because it was a mixed tag and it was a comedy match, like you're talking about, it was her. Like when she first started, like green as grass from Bridgewater. You ever play, uh, wrestled in Bridgewater at the uh, Bob's place? There was never nobody there. Always like five people in the crowd. <laughs> small little bar. I used to go to every show because it's right up the street from my house. Uh, South Coast used to go there when Ricard was booking. Yep. It was like yeah. a tiny place, always like three, five people in the crowd, you know, just the girlfriends and like me and like two other people. And I'd be in the front row filming, giving the, getting drunk, giving the, you know, <laughs> harassing the wrestlers. Um, but it was her against Ricard. And I got like four or 5,000, I think it's up to like 8,000 views now. Like crazy. I'm like, why is everybody watching this? It was because she was on it. She was like 18 at the time or whatever. You know what I mean? But it was a mix. It was a inter. Because somebody said something about um, uh, having the mixed matches. And I go, yep. look, they would, South Coast was doing it back in 2001. This ain't anything new. And everybody watched it. I was like, why is this getting so many hits? And that's why I started posting so many girl videos, like the female wrestling, because it gets yep. so many hits. But that's what made me do it, her video. Um, when she was with, that's how she started. Uh, she was dating Steve Ricard uh, at that time. And um, I, I, I don't think I've ever, ever did a show there. But that is definitely funny. I, that's, I seen Steve actually do that gimmick one time in North Adams. And that, was, that was funny. Uh, he's actually, he's, he's good. I, I was surprised by it. I told Steve after, I said, Steve, I was, I was surprised, you know. But yeah. That's, I had to ask uh, who it was. Somebody had to tell me who it was. I'm like, who is that? <laughs> the... Um, uh, the day of that match, we were um, we were driving to the uh, the show, and she says something about Danny Doring. Um, Danny Doring worked for ECW, and then he did some like independence on um, in New Jersey. Yeah, he used to and, tag with Roadkill. Yes, yes, um, Amish Roadkill. Um, she said. The only person that made her laugh during a match was Danny Doring. So I took that as a challenge. And when we got back after the match, and I was like, so what made you laugh more, Danny Doring or me? <laughs> and she said, definitely tonight. <laughs> but, um, and the funny thing with that is she had um, Kid Mikazi, she had him video record that match. And I said, I need a copy of this match. She goes, okay, yeah, no problem. And I said, but don't show anybody this match. Because, I, I, you know, it's, I don't know. It was, I, I, it was fun. It was, it was a good match. But I just didn't want people seeing it. So that night, we go to Dave & Buster's. A whole bunch of us go to Dave & Buster's. And um, Nikki Rocks was there. And uh, I, I see Anna and Ariel showing Nikki. Uh, something on the video recorder. I'm like, you're not showing our match, are you? And Nikki's like laughing her ass off. So I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. So the next day we go to WXW Alpha Show and she's showing all the girls, you know, Melissa Sampson. Um, oh, uh, Beth Phoenix. She was there. Like she's showing the, oh, this is our match from last night. And 
who walks in? Homicide. Ricky Reyes. You know, they come in to support the girls. And I'm like, oh, God, she's showing homicide. And homicide's laughing his ass off. And I'm like, oh, but I never got a copy of the match. <laughs> but um, so that that was by far probably one of the most fun matches I had. And then after that, uh, Danny Harvey um, started booking me for APW. And there's a story about Danny. Um, it's, a, it's a Rick Fuller story, too, in here. But um, uh, this is a Puerto Rican Punisher Bay telling you to check out Chop's videos on YouTube. He's got the best collection of classics in New England wrestling and professional wrestling in general. So go ahead, subscribe, give him a follow, give him a like, and hit the bell notification so that you get the latest videos when they drop. Y no te olvide, que guste o no te guste, Chop videos, esa es la que hay. If you haven't subscribed yet to Chop's videos, I don't know what you're waiting for, man, because, I mean, he's already dropped so much great stuff, and he's about to be working on the Primal Conflict documentary series, which is, oh, man, it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait for it. I mean, I was there from before the beginning to after the end, which might surprise a lot of people, but I was there, and I was like a fly on the wall, so I got lots of stories, and... uh all great times, great times, great people. I can't wait to hear stories from guys like Jose Perez and Livewire. Some guys I have the utmost respect for. Uh, you, then you have stories about Astro Man. You, there'll be some stories in there about New Jack, Cronus, Balls, Sandman. I mean, all Kevin Charisma, Vertebreaker, Tiger Khan. I mean, just so much, so much good stuff. And if you were a fan at that time and you were going to these shows, you you remember this stuff and. I don't think there has been an indie promotion since then that had that loyal fan base that Primal had. I mean, I was at the shows and I would go out and watch the matches with the crowd just because I wanted. I mean, how could you not want to see Jamie Payne and Nemesis? Oh, my God. <laughs> talk about it. Talk about hardcore. I mean, and then you see some new guys come on the scene like Scarecrow and Q-Ball, who I thought had tremendous, like, the new new gimmicks just okay th these guys are awesome so man you, you, I, I can't wait and uh if you were a fan back then or if you're just you, if you were a friend of like anything of ecw if if you're not familiar with the local scene subscribe to chop's videos and and, and you gotta check out this this documentary series it was it was good times and it's gonna be good stories